in the pursuit of truth and common sense in an unbelievable world. You're listening to The Right Mind Podcast with your host, Todd Showalter. Hello, everybody. I'm Todd Showalter, and welcome to Right Mind. Today, my guest is film director John D. Hancock. He directed Bang the Drum Slowly, among other films. How are you doing, John? I'm good. I'm good. I'm. It's a wonderful, warm day where I am, and I'm... Where, are you, where actually are you? Where, where are you at? Northwest Indiana. Okay. All right. Well, I know the, that area somewhat. Pass through it. Now you, uh, okay. Now you, uh, you, you started out way back. I mean, the, the films that you're known for, obviously, uh, bang the drum slowly back in the seventies. Uh, you did weeds prancer. I saw that a long time ago. Uh, but you started out in theater, didn't you? I mean, you got your directorial debut, I believe when you were what, 22 years old off Broadway. Yeah, I did a, a Brecht play, a man to man off Broadway. That was a, uh, a big hit and got me started. Okay. Okay. And, and before, I mean, so was that, what was it, was that always your path? Because I, I mean, I see that you're also a Harvard graduate. That's kind of impressive. I mean, were you studying theater in Harvard? No, there was no, there were no practical theater courses in Harvard at that point, but I directed a lot of plays there. And okay. It was, it was all run by undergraduates. So actually it was, it was a, a very good experience for uh, how to make things happen yourself. Okay. Okay. And what year was that? Was that back in the early seventies? I graduated in 61. Back in 61. Okay. So then after that, you went to Europe, didn't you? Did you study in Europe then also? I did. Uh, I went and hung around the Berliner Ensemble Brex Theater in East Berlin. Okay. Okay. And I I did one of his plays uh, off Broadway. All right. So you came back. Okay. So you did the play off Broadway and then obviously you transitioned into film. What, uh, how did that all come about? Well, it didn't happen right away. I, I was the artistic director of the San Francisco actors workshop, which was a big deal. And the Pittsburgh playhouse and I won an OB and this and that. And then I got a grant from the AFI. Okay. It was a new organization at that point to, to make a short. The uh, American film Institute. Yeah. Okay. All right. I made one about uh, businessmen that play touch football in the park called Sticking My Fingers, Fleet My Feet. Oh, okay. Okay. Now you were nominated for an Academy Award for that, weren't you? Yeah, I was. And that got me my first two features. So that's how I got started in film. Gotcha. So you got nominated for an Academy Award. That's a pretty big feat. And how old were you then? Oh, I don't know, 29. Wow. Okay. So that kind of sprung board everything right into the Hollywood scene. So it's a big, it's a big difference though, isn't it? Cause uh, moving from theater into film, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's a different, uh, a different uh, group of animals, so to speak. Huh? Well, it, it's, it, of course it's different in, in some ways, but the center of what a director does is very similar. I mean, you're, you're trying to get the most out of a group of people. You're deciding what's clear, what's funny. Uh, you're trying to tell a story. Uh, and the technical, the technical things, though, are quite different. I mean, it took me a while to learn about lenses and the, how to use the camera and that kind of thing. Okay, yeah, because, you know, I've worked in theater and film myself. And one of the things, that, I mean, the biggest difference I, th- I personally think is in film, you'll do a scene and then you'll have, uh, you know, maybe an hour or something. You got to, you know, reset everything up, you know, in film in, in, in plays rather, you know, it's continuous. I mean, you get up there, you oh, start the that, show. Yeah. It, it's how to handle that kind of destructive waiting in films is hard. Yeah. Well, how do you go about directing something like that? Do you think it breaks your flow? Not me. I'm busy during that hour, but, um, for actors, yeah, I think it, they have to somehow uh, not uh, keep it too hot too, too much of the time. You can't. I mean, you can't always be uh, ready to go. You know, you, you'll go nuts while they're lighting. Yeah. I mean, have you ever, I mean, when you shoot, you obviously shoot, uh, you know, a lot of times out of sequence. Have you ever done a, a film where you've shot it almost like a play from uh, beginning to end? No, I shoot. No, I never have. I've always shot it out of sequence. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Well, now you got involved. How did the whole film uh, bang the drum slowly? I mean, that was back in 73. It was uh, Robert De Niro starred in that. I mean, I assume that was one of his first films. How did that all come about? Well, the uh, CBS had bought the short, the touch football short. Okay. 
and they showed it at halftime on their Thanksgiving Day football game. And uh, a lawyer in Chicago who had some money and wanted to make a film saw it and thought, oh boy, this is a, a director that maybe would be good for the project I want to do, which is a very famous baseball novel called Bang the Drum Slowly. Uh -huh. And so he called me up and flew me to Chicago and we put the deal together and I did it. Wow. Okay. And so, I mean, when I, shooting a film, I mean, that can be a very long winded process. I mean, so from the time that you were actually asked to do this film to when you actually started, was that a relatively short period or was it dragged out over time? It was, a, I mean, I guess compared to say weeds, which took a long time to put together, it was a short time. I mean, he actually had the money to do it. Yeah, so, that's always a big thing, right? That, made, yeah. that yeah. made a huge difference. But, um, well, you know, we, we, we took our time casting. I mean, we saw, we were in the in a suite in the Warwick Hotel in New York, and we saw actors every 15 minutes for, I don't know, six weeks. Right. Five days a week. So, uh, and then, of course, there was scouting the locations and, you know, all that kind of thing. But, uh De Niro says I read him seven times. Oh, you read uh, De Niro had to read seven times for, for yeah. the part? Well, it's possible. I mean, we, we he had to read for the rich guy's wife. Uh -huh. And also, uh, we knew we wanted him, and we knew we also wanted Moriarty, Michael Moriarty. Mm -hmm. Right. We did, but we didn't know which should play which part, so we would read them with the one playing the pitcher and the other catcher and then the other way and that kind of thing. I think it is good to read people several times sure. uh, because maybe you were just feeling good the day you read them and, or, or bad. And so it's, it's good to correct any possible story. It's, it, you know, casting. I ask my students, I teach uh, directing at Columbia College in Chicago and also at Second City. Mm -hmm. And I ask them, what, what percent of directing is casting? And what would you say was the answer to that? Uh, me personally, I, I'd say that's probably about that's about ninety percent of it. I mean, getting the right. I, it, I mean, maybe not in a film like uh, two thousand and one, but in most pictures, it is. You know, sure. It really, uh, yeah. So, I think it pays to be thorough. Oh, absolutely. Have, have you ever done a project where you cast somebody and then realized once you were into it that this wasn't a good idea? I have several times. I've, I've, <laughs> I've uh, three or four times I've fired the the lead. Really? Uh, yeah. Well, I rehearse. Uh, you know, most films you don't rehearse, but since I started in the theater, I've always insisted on rehearsing for three or four weeks first, uh -huh. because uh, first of all, it enables me to plan how I'm going to block it and all that. But it also uh, catches any mistakes before you can, you put them on film. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you've filmed somebody bad, it's very hard to, right. to say, geez, I made a terrible mistake. Sure. And, you know, I think also a good thing about rehearsing and, and even I, I it's actually a quote by De Niro. And he was saying, I mean, the, the biggest part, I mean, you don't even want to have to think about your lines. They just have to come right. naturally. Right. And uh, rehearsal, I believe, will, you know, definitely help do that. Don't you think? Of course. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I think a lot of uh, good things coming out come out from uh, the, the theatrical directing when brought into film. So now you're, you're directing films now. You got De Niro. I assume was he? He wasn't a huge star at that point, though, was he? No, he hadn't done very much. Okay, so was he pretty easy to work with at that he point? Was, he was wonderful. He was a delight. Yeah. Good deal. Okay, so you, you did that. You moved on to other films. Now you also, I read, uh, you you were friends with Tennessee Williams. Okay, now how did this all come about? That's a that's a pretty big, uh, <laughs> a pretty big deal in my opinion. I mean, so did you work with him on plays? Yeah, yeah. We tried to do a film together, but no one would uh, fund it. But uh, yeah, we did a Milk Train together in San Francisco, and then uh, we did two character play in Los Angeles, and worked together on on a number of working together on his scripts uh film scripts well he wanted to he wanted to make a movie uh out of a biography of rambo 
Rambo? Not like not the Sylvester Stallone one. No, that's <laughs> that's Rambo. This right, is right, right. The decadent poet Rambo. Right, right. And um, so I, I I was hot at that point. And, the, you know, the studio said, well, oh, we want to make movies with you. What do you want to do? Uh, and I took his I took the biography around with Tennessee attached and no one would make it. They said, well, he's not any good anymore. What year was um, this? Uh, oh, I don't know, 70, 71, something in there. Okay, so it's pretty okay. So, so what did you end up? Uh, yeah, didn't you? Did, but you wrote some stuff together, didn't you? Well, no, I just helped him. I never, we never wrote together. You can't take credit for, you know, any of his famous plays or anything. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but he, he, he liked to work with me. He liked, we liked each other. Yeah. And uh, so he felt I was, I was good at structure and good at, this and that and so we were we we were good friends and uh i wish we'd done more together I, there was a he wrote a uh a, a wonderful he wrote a screenplay called stop rocking that hallmark wanted to do at one point uh-huh. uh but uh that never happened Huh, that's really okay. So I'm, we, I, I do this show from St. Louis, and he's uh, from St. Louis, and he's a pretty big deal uh, from here. So that's uh, that's pretty impressive. Well, you mentioned on something just a little while ago. You said you know you were able to work with him because you were hot. The uh, studios, you know, pretty much gave you uh, you know free reign. I mean, well, they didn't actually. They just said they would. <laughs> oh, they said they would. So, all right. Well, that's typical Hollywood, right? I mean, one thing. I mean, until the money's there and you're signing on the dotted line. But you, I mean, at one part, at one point in time. I mean, it's it's easier to make films. What is that? I mean, is, is that kind of like a, a curve type thing? Do most people hit a peak and then go down and go back up again? But I mean, as far as your career, what do you think the high point to date? I mean, who knows what's tomorrow? I mean, but what do you think the high point was? Oh, I suppose the response to Bang the Drum slowly. Yeah. Okay. A long time ago. But, you know, I've uh, I've been offered, always offered things over the years, you know. Okay. Okay. Any film, like we talked about actors and things, but are there any projects that you've taken on that, uh, you know, are more dear to your heart than others? Well, Weeds, Weeds was uh, very dear to my heart. My wife and I wrote it together and it was based on a, uh, a real inmate that we knew who was at San Quentin and okay. got, saw a production of Waiting for Godot and got very excited about uh, arty theater and formed a prison drama group. And then when he got out, took his the play that he'd written on tour with uh, inmates. So it was very, it's, it's very funny. And, and uh, uh, Nick, we did it with Nick Dolte. And, right, right. That was the late 80s, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a pleasure. I, I'm also fond of Prancer. I mean, I like I like all sure. of it. Well, I, okay. Last picture I've done is is uh, called "The Girls of Summer," and it's on Hulu now and uh, Amazon Prime, and it's about a uh, the drummer in a country girls uh, band. Okay, it's wonderful, and it's a kind of strange, bittersweet love story. And and what's the name of that again? I'm sorry. The Girls of Summer. The Girls of Summer, and is currently on uh, Hulu. Okay. And when did you film? When did you film that? Everywhere. Uh, the summer of eighteen. Okay. All right. What's the biggest difference you think? You know, doing films now as opposed to like you know thirty, forty years ago. Well, they open differently. Uh, I mean, I did a, a very successful horror picture called Let's Go Jessica to Death. Mm-hmm. And it and pictures like Bang that are slowly would open platformed. They would open at one theater in New York. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know, a month later they would open at 20 theaters in the area. And right. then and then they I mean the word of mouth would build and then they would open 400 theaters nationally, right? Mm-hmm. But now it's all the opening weekend and they go out with, you know, about 2000 prints and open in every theater and have big television ad campaigns. And uh, it, it means it's a different kind of audience they're trying to attract. And it's a different uh, 
way of publicizing a picture. Uh, so you, the pictures kind of tend to be different. And we, we get all of these uh, uh, superhero pictures, you know. Right. I, mean, I, I think movies to me are, there's still many, many wonderful pictures being made, but the, the amount of screen space that's being devoted to shit is uh, increased. Yeah, and I agree with that. And one of the things I've seen, I mean, they call them, uh, you know, tent pole pictures. So you've got these films that you want to, you know, sell out the theaters. And one, I mean, you've got a lot. I mean, they seem to all be this cookie cutter type of temple structure, where whether it's Marvel and, or, or whatnot, where you get your, you know, you, you pretty much know what you're going to get. Um, but a lot of the good content seems to be, and I'm not saying that stuff isn't good. It all has its place. But some of the more, um, you know, uh, thought out uh, content seems to be going straight to streaming now. I mean, and you were talking about openings. I mean, a lot of films or, right now are going straight to uh, just, streaming. Uh, you know, to cable, to cable. Right, uh, right. Uh, cable streaming, right. Yeah, there's wonderful work being done. There really is. Right. Acting is improved. Directing is improved. Uh, they're also, I mean, Netflix is making a lot of bad pictures to them. You know, just to, to fill their, to compete with the other streamers, they're taking projects they shouldn't be doing. And well, that's just it. And I think it could be a double-edged sword, don't you? Because, yeah, I mean, you do have all these new streaming platforms coming out, which is great for actors and filmmakers and directors and everybody else, because you've got to fill that content. You've got to do it. But it seems like everybody, uh, especially in this digital age that we're uh, living in, uh, when it's much easier than ever to actually make a film, it seems that you would do have a lot of content that's coming out. But like you said, a lot of it's just crap. I mean, what, what do you think the secret is, aside from just being good? What do you think the secret is to break out of all that? I'm not certain. I mean, uh, I, mean well, I, I wish there were more single screen art theaters for sure. <laughs> Well, right, right. Well, they're saying now, I mean, even like, yeah, I mean, I, I, good comedies, uh, you know, a lot of the films that are good comedies, they're just going to go straight to streaming because, you know, they want to save the room for the tentpole pictures, uh, you know, for Iron Man 24 to, you know, to go to the multiplex. Uh, comedies don't play that well on the home screen. I mean, you know, audiences find what's funny for each other. Sure. So, I mean, the, the last... The, the last really funny experience I had in a theater was I went to the opening night of uh, one of those Sasha Baron Cohen pictures. Oh, sure. Borat? Yeah, to Borat. And it was like 95% full. Mm -hmm. And it was like the old days when the audience, you know, they they laugh so long you can't hear the lines. And sure, right. Yeah. And that's that's thrilling. You don't get, you know, you get a little grin. Not you don't even get a chuckle at home. You just yeah. get a little wry grin, and, and it's not comedies don't play as well. No, I don't. They don't play. I think a lot of it though just comes to dollars. I mean, you look at the studios. I mean, I mean, the bottom line is the bottom line with them. And if I can, uh, you know, sell out. You know, a, a, a whole bunch of megaplexes with Iron Man, as I mentioned, or you know, Wonder Woman twelve or whatnot. Yeah. The, the the comedies don't have the space, and that's a shame. I mean, yeah, I agree with you. I love going to a movie. I mean, I mean, remember you know the raunchy stuff from the eighties, Porky's, all that stuff. You mm -hmm. know, uh, I mean, and we would laugh and laugh and laugh. And you're right, Animal House. And you you know you don't have that just sitting alone or, or with a couple of people uh, that you do with a big you know. No theater full of people laughing with you. And that's a shame. I mean, it's possible to watch animal house at home and, and not hear a laugh. That's, you know, well, you know, that's true. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? I mean, in this digital age, I mean, do you have some stuff? I mean, you're a director, obviously, but uh, with budgets coming down, are you actually producing content now? I'm trying to, I got a project about a, a New York cop who falls in love with the female serial killer. Oh wow, that sounds you know, good. All the all love right. story, yeah. Kind of and I'm I'm trying to cast them in a way that will get financing. So, 
Oh, and what, when you said when you're putting that together, I mean, you know, you're, it's obviously going to be a, a feature. Are you just pitching at this point, or do you have the screenplay? I have a screenplay. Yeah, sure. Wow. A good screenplay. People, I mean, it's won a lot of uh, little contests around the country on the internet, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to attach actors. But that's hard because you, you, you need to get through the agents. You need to come with a firm offer. And I don't have the money to make a firm offer. So that's, it's like a chicken or egg situation. Sure. Because right. Some back door to the actor, you know? Well, and so when you go about doing that, is, is that one of your first things? I mean, do you try to attach somebody that's going to, you know, that's hopefully. What I'm trying to do, yeah. I've made, I, you know, when I started out, I made two very successful pictures. Uh, and let's get Jessica to death and bang that I'm solely in they did no one was in them in terms of stardom they were they had no one in them right and yet they were su successful so i've been trying to repeat that uh and the films get shown but they they don't get distributed like i want them to i mean both of those pictures paramount bought and and put a big campaign on them and really distributed them well but i can't seem to get a major to pick up the pictures i've been making recently Okay, and so when you you're obviously you know I, I say I like it. I don't know how to sell it. You do you know? have an agent now, or are you doing it individually? Both. Both. Yeah. yeah. So you're in Indiana, as you said. I mean, are you? Do you think it matters now where you live? I mean, are you still? How's that all work? I mean, you're still dealing with each coast. I mean, it it seems to be a smaller world now. Uh, does it? I mean, are you still in the Hollywood scene, so to speak? Not like I. Not like I would be if i lived out there but yes yeah yeah okay did you see what what, what what's the transit i guess it's a little bit different living in indiana than it is in la isn't it <laughs> you know Just, our house in malibu burnt in one of those big wildfires in the early 90s so we moved back to the family fruit farm that's why i'm living in indiana oh, okay okay back in the 90s gotcha so i mean as of right now you're, you're working on a script i see you but you you, you released a, the new film that you said is on is on hulu i mean do you have a docket of things that you i mean are you still taking projects to work out i mean as far as on other people's films i mean are they approaching you saying hey john would you like to direct this this uh this yeah, piece first I haven't seen anything I wanted to do, but I have three projects of my own that I want to do. So, and I'm 83, so I don't know how, you know, I want to do three projects before I die. So, well, you know, I mean, that's what's, that's what keeps you young. Don't you think? Sure. Of course. So uh, what's the other projects that you're working on? Are they all in script form? I mean, as far as I, mean, are. Still I have three, three completed screenplays, one of them, I, you know, I, I did a production of Midsummer Night's Dream that I want to know before. Right. And so I've done a screen kind of, I, it's not what I did exactly in the theater, but it's a, it's calling on some of the same things, uh, a screenplay version of Midsummer Night's Dream that I'd like to do. Then I have, I have another project about kind of idealistic bank robbers. What's that? What do you mean idealistic bank robbers? Well, that? They, they, they only roll out, will rob banks that are, uh, uh, are nationally big chains and not no local banks and they they think a lot they think more than it is healthy for them about the environment and <laughs> they have a kind of strange downward spiral uh it's called south by southeast oh wow, i like it okay and so you're uh, pitching that too yeah and it's funny and moving and it, it's every day I'm, I'm, I have three pieces of material. I'm very happy. I'm so when you, good. when you pitch now, I mean, and, and you go about it, do you go about it just as you, like you would have like 20 or 30 years ago? Is it a, di is it a different process? I mean, do you just maybe make the phone call and say, Hey, I want to give you, I, I got something you might be interested in, or is it, uh, you know, just, is it more casual? How, how does that work now at this stage uh, different than it used to? It's trying to get in the door just like it always was. And what do you think? What do you think? Uh, the it's harder studio? now because of age discrimination. It's harder now because um, they're looking for Iron Man, you know. So yeah, and that seems like such a sellout, don't you? I mean, they're going to make something they know already fills the seats. But don't right. you? There's a lot of content that goes by the wayside that unfortunately, I mean, there's a lot of good films I've seen streaming that uh, I thought, wow, I would have gone and seen this in the, in the theater had they just given it a chance. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a shame. It wow. is a shame. It is a shame. 
So you've got that going on. Okay. Well, we got a few more minutes left. Do you want to, I mean, if you were to talk to like new filmmakers today, new directors, uh, people just trying to get into the film business, aside from saying, don't do it. What, uh, what advice would you give them? Well, I would say do it. I've had a very happy life. I mean, I've loved what I've done. Uh, I think you do have to go to Los Angeles. I I don't think people should be afraid to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't think you could do it from Chicago or, Atlanta or New Orleans, I think you need to actually go to Los Angeles where there are people that can say yes to projects, you know, everything. You need to go to where the decisions are made. Sure. And mm-hmm. Network there. It's A lot of it is just social networking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, I you, you meet somebody at a party and he offers you a picture. I mean, that's constant that you know, that's, that'll never change. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem like directing is so hard, but maybe it is. Well, yeah. I mean, you're kind of the ca- the captain of the ship. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, why is so much bad work being done on Netflix? I think it comes down to money. I mean, I think, I mean, mm-hmm. you put, well, I think, yeah, I think if it's easy, I mean, a lot of it, I think in my opinion, there's too many people that are saying, well, what, what is this demo like? Or what is that demo like? Or, you know, what did well that's in the past? And they're, they're, you got numbers guys, but they're not real movie or theater. I mean, they're, they're, they're trying, they're, they're looking at it totally from a business standpoint right. and they're overlooking, you know, good content just for the sake of, uh, you know, either making this, getting an audience or making a sale. Uh, that's what I think it is. There's or just a numbers game. Like, if, you, if you make something that was like something successful, maybe when they, it fails and they get mad at you, you can say, well, I, it, it was like Tootsie. I thought it would, you know. Right, right. So, it's like Tootsie on ice. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> so, but I mean, actually the pictures that are really interesting and that really do well are ones that are not like anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, when The Godfather came out, it wasn't like anything. Right. You know, when well, the just it. came out, it wasn't like anything. You know? well, and and that, that's hard to do. I mean, to come out with yeah. something very innovative and different. That, yeah. And then once you do it, then uh, then everybody loves it. Then everybody's sure. going to make and a copy of it. You know, wants to make Balachi papers or something in the wake of The Godfather. Or whatever. Right. Yeah, exactly. So... So, I mean, you, as far as right now, I mean, if you were to, you know, say, this is how I wish it, is there a certain period in time that you worked in that if you could bring back, what would that be? Well, the seventies. You think that would, and I think the seventies, some, some of the best films came out of the seventies, some of the best acting. I mean, you look, yeah. I mean, some of the best, uh, you know, directing, a lot of people are just starting out then. And plus don't you, the seventies for, it just had a different look, you know, it, it you could, you see a seventies film and you know, it's a seventies film almost. I mean, it just had a different type of quality to it. Don't you think? I do. I do. And the big studio system was breaking up and they were taking a chance on young people that had weird ideas and because somehow easy rider got gave this big studios the idea oh we better get with it there's something new happening in the country and we better uh, tap into that and not just continue to make uh, stanley kramer pictures exactly right right well you've been, it's been a pleasure having you on uh I no i enjoy talking to you wonderful okay. Any last words? Any way uh, you want anybody to get in contact uh, with you? Or would you rather them just leave you alone? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> What's your, how, how can they get in contact with you? Uh, my email is john, J-O-H-N. Okay. At Film Acres. F-I-L- Film Acres. Okay. F-I-L-M-A-C-R-E-S. Got Not it. makers, but acres. We will put that up on the, uh, the screen so that everybody gets it. And I appreciate you being on. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, John. And thank you for joining me. I'm Todd Showalter, and you've been watching or listening to Right Mind. And remember, if you don't have a right mind, you don't have a mind at all. Till next time, bye-bye. This has been the Right Mind Podcast with Todd Showalter. 